Good morning, Potter's House. How are we doing this morning? Amen. It's good to see you here in the house this morning. Would you all stand on your feet? So before we go to worship, let's just go to prayer for the Lord this morning. Are you excited to be here? Yeah. Amen. Let's pray. God, I just pray right now for your mighty move to happen in this room. We expect big things, God, from you and your spirit. And we welcome you. We invite you, God, to come and just set on us today. In Jesus' name. And everybody shouted. Are you ready to worship the Lord? Let's do that.
Somebody, thank you. Somebody, thank you. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide the spirit.
Say his name, say Jesus. Call on his name, Jesus. There is 
Position yourself right now. Uh, we may have been living with your mind out of alignment of His Word. This is a moment to reposition. S fix your posture. Fix your posture. Fix your posture. Stand straight before Him. He's reminding us. He's reminding us. There's no weapon for. There's no weapon for. There's no weapon for, there's no weapon for, we'll prosper, there's no weapon for, keep on work, keep on work. Doesn't stand a chance of doesn't stand a chance It doesn't stand a chance no. My God is bigger hey. hey My God is stronger My God is mighty to save My God is victory hey. My God Break off every chain. There is power that can. Oh, there's power in your name. Power in your name. Come on, somebody say Jesus. Jesus. Mountains tremble, mountains tremble, and they say his name, Jesus. Now revealed in you. 
beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The Take Jesus. He didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love is greater.
Breaking the bread of your body, for spilling the wine of your blood. Thank you. My heart will sing forever. Thank you for breaking the bread of your body, for spilling. Listen, if you felt like giving up, giving in, we have an agenda today, an order of service. And we'll let the Holy Spirit have his way. Is that all right? I think it matters the most. It's the priority of the moment. If you felt like giving up this week, I want you to stand right here. Start walking. Come on, there's more of you. I'll wait. I don't know if you heard me in the back, but if you felt like giving up this week, you to come stand right here. Yeah, it's all right. a liar, okay, so that's the one thing you have to understand right out of the gate, Alan, the enemy is a liar, am I right, he's a liar, he's a, he's a thief, he's a robber, and he's trying to steal from you, 
God is greater than the enemy. Lift your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, everybody help me out. Don't be a spectator, be a participator. Let's pray for those that have almost given up this week. But you're still standing. Come on, you're still standing. In the name of Jesus. Tell them thank you.
call you to be. Sorry, what? An intercessor. We pray over us today. We pray over these that have, have thought they were going to lose everything. They thought they were going to lose their life. Your friends are up here. Your loved ones are up here. Your family up here. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be magnanimous. It doesn't have to be stupendous. It has to be what God is using you to do. God wants your voice to be heard in this moment. Are you ready to pray?
Come on, let's give God praise. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. So I defeat the spirit of suicide. In Jesus' name. Can we agree with that right now? I defeat it. I defeat it in the name of Jesus. Can we pray with that? That same kind of strength? Because it's trying to, uh, it's trying to get into everybody's heads these days. Can we just begin to pray that God's spirit would set on them and rip that demon right out of their spirit and not allow that thing to attach to their psyche and to their mind and into their heart? Can we just pray that right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that there would be a, a spirit that would rise up against the enemy, that the, the, the devil of suicide, that's as much credit as you get, the devil of suicide would be defeated in Jesus' name, that no longer, no longer would the enemy have reign over those minds and those hearts to say that it's over, that it's done, that I'm about to give up my life. Father, I pray, God, that they see the glory, that they see the presence, that they see the mark that you've left on their hearts, God, that they, they would make decisions not based on their circumstances or their surroundings, God, but they would make decisions based on what you could do about their circumstances and their situations, God, that everything is not hopeless, everything is not desperate, but God, you're going to heal their minds by your spirit in Jesus' name. And send a revival into their hearts. Send a renewing spirit. A restoration take place. In Jesus' name. If you believe that with all of your heart, would you just give the Lord a huge offering of praise amen I'll sing this one more time and then we could go back to our seats and be seated I, I love what God has done here already today and I got a message for you so we're just going to pray let's worship him one more moment you don't have to come But you always do You show up in splendor And you change the whole say his name as you're seated. Just say Jesus. 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 Amen. 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 You can be seated in the house. Thank you, worship team. 
We give God one more praise. Amen. keenly aware of God doing mighty, mighty things in this room. I was, I was, the Lord was speaking to me last night as I was praying. He just said, you know, even when you don't know God's doing something in your midst, just because they're not out of their seats or in, in your face or at the altar or laying down, doesn't mean that God's not moving. So I'm keenly aware that God's moving in your life, even when you haven't stepped out of your seat to come down to an altar. I know God is moving in you. If God is moving in you, would you just give him praise? Amen. 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 <laughs> That's not right. Yeah, I'm going to save that to the end. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open up. We're going to start right in. I promise I'll leave some time. We have some things we'd like to do. If we don't get to it today, we'll get to it next week. I'm going to be in Acts chapter 10. Last week I was in Acts chapter 3. I've been speaking specifically about proclamations out of your mouth, things that you say out of your house, out of your spirit. In my prayer time as I was studying, I was feeling as if we have a tendency to overlook um, in the Word of God what God says about proclamations and the proclamations that are supposed to be over our lives. And we start proclaiming things that don't make sense. <laughs> you know, I want the newest whatever. I want the newest of this. I, God, I know you can do this in my life. I, I want, I need, I have to have. I want this thing, so make this happen. And we get to the point where it becomes not a proclamation of life, it becomes a proclamation of a grocery list or a, a proclamation of a want list or a, your will be done, not his will be done in your life. And I think a lot of times Jesus was the opposite of that. He was more about being a servant to the people than he was to be this, um, this self-loathing, self-ish person. Never did I ever read him say, you know, give me something and then I'll give you something. And I feel a lot of times like we, as Christians, we, uh, we got it backwards. Like our service, it, 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 we, we stick the bubble gum, or we stick the quarter in the bubble gum machine and hope that it's a, a purple one, not a red one, you know. I don't want it to be this way, God. I want it to be that way. I want it to be the way that I want it to be, not because sometimes... Sometimes we feel like if we could get what we want, it might be better than what God has for us. Truth of the matter is that nothing that we get from God is bad. It's all good. It just is not on the level of good that you would like it to be. But it's all good. And if we, if we would tend to that moment in our life where we would say, God, I... I would rather have whatever you have for me than what I want for myself. Then I wonder what kind of stuff we would have in our lives, what kind of joy we would be walking around with, what kind of peace we would have, what kind of sense of direction we might have instead of just wandering around going, I want the purple one, not the red one. Or complaining about what God has already given us and then or taking for granted the things that he's already set into motion into our lives. And so I wonder how many times we've gotten to the place where as Christians, what you want overrides what God wants. And, and so then that makes the pursuit of what you want more important than the pursuit of what he wants. And so then we get our minds twisted up to think that, God, if I can go after that, if that's what I think would make me happy, I will run with it as, as much as I can. And what happens is you become so busy going after something that's not supposed to be in your life that you're exhausted in your busyness of trying to get there. And I've contemplated so many times, 
God, is this the direction? Have you ever asked God that question? Is this the direction that you want me to go? But listen, the, most of the times, I don't necessarily know the direction until I arrive around the position that he wants me to be in because if I am just obedient and being in the place that he wants me to be in, then I will be ready on time, not my time. God equips those for the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to jump into some stuff today, but I may not have time unless you're okay staying a little bit. I pray that's the case. Have you ever felt unworthy? Un have you ever felt like an untouchable? Have you ever felt like you've made someone else feel unworthy? Have you ever made someone else feel like they're untouchable? What in the world are you proclaiming over your life? What are, what, are you, what are you saying in the midst of your struggles? The reality is God did a big, big miracle right here, and y'all got to witness it just now. He may have rescued some folks from some dire situations. He probably restored some. Come on, God is moving in the potter's house in Mansfield. He, he, he restored some folks back to him for a moment. He gave them a sense of confidence and put that back and instilled inside of them a sense of moving forward. Sometimes when you come to the end of yourself, you find yourself. I want us to look at Acts chapter 10, verse 34. This, this is the uh, quintessential gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ preached by Peter for the very first time in such a way that we've ever seen it. This is the first time it's ever been preached to people who were not Jews. They were Gentiles. And I'm going to get, in the coming weeks, I hope that you would get hungry for the word of God and, and not weary in the details. Because I know most folks... Would just like to come, chill, feel a few goosebumps, and you know, and 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 uh, a couple of Holy Ghost shouts, and the music was great, and then head out with their family. I want you to be the Bible believing church. I want you to dig into the Word of God. I want you to go away from here today, going, I want the Word of God in me more. So, like what he was talking about, I want to go home and like read it for myself, so that I can get it inside of me. Acts chapter 10, what we've seen come on the scene in, in chapter 2, creatures that are in the room, the Holy Ghost came in the upper room, filled them with the Holy Spirit, then, they, then Peter goes out, he preaches to the masses, 5,000 people get saved, people filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues, fire came on top of their heads, like, like tongues of fire came on top of their heads, like this is reality. And that's what you saw here this morning, tongues of fire sitting on people. His Holy Spirit filling, filling folks up, calling people out, giving people callings. When, when will we wait for God? Ah, I just, I can't go forward yet. I just, when will we wait for him to do something in our lives? We get so antsy. We get so uneasy. God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. It's like a college student getting ready to graduate. Oh, I got one of those. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what to do. I got to find the job. I got to get this. I got to have this. I want a car. I need a house. I need all this stuff. No, you don't. You just need to chill. And allow the Lord to lead you. It, it, we, get so, we get so anxious about things. We get so, life is not meant to be this hard, folks. We get so tied up and bent up about things and frustrated about things and, and, we, and we don't know which direction to go but here's, here's, here's Peter he's about to preach to the, the Gentiles this didn't happen just because he wanted it to happen 
I need you to understand this before we read this scripture. Holy Spirit fell. Acts chapter 2, 3. Acts chapter 3 and 4. We find Peter before the Sanhedrin, the people who killed Jesus, murdered him. Get some Bible in you this morning. I need you to, okay, I get you. I know where you're going. Later on, we find Saul is persecuting the church at an all-time crazy rate. He's killing Christians. This is a persecuted church. Peter, he stood before the Sanhedrin, the same people who killed and murdered Jesus. He stood before them with a boldness to tell them that the only way to get to heaven is Jesus. So like what y'all are doing is wrong. He's telling the religious leaders of that day, like, you don't know what you're doing. Here's this Peter who was what? Who was he? Just a nobody from nowhere. And he's telling the leadership, Jesus is the way. Just a few weeks before that, he had denied Jesus three times. And now he's telling them that Jesus is the way. He was questioned three times, denied him three times, fulfilling prophecy that Jesus would say, you will deny me. He's fulfilling those things. And then when he gets to the Sanhedrin, he ain't denying them anymore. We rush ahead to chapter 10. I'm going to jump into the place where Peter finds himself in front of Cornelius. I want us to look at verse 34. So, like, if you ever need a place, I got so much. If, we, if you ever need a place, like, God, I don't know how to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone. Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Start right there. I don't know what to say to anybody. I don't even know what the gospel is. Here it is. Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Peter says it in a couple verses. He tells him what the gospel is, the good news, the message of what it is. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God showed no partiality. I need you to hear that. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is, is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. He tells the whole story. Verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Somebody say power. And he went about doing good and healing all those who were pressed by the devil. And for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. This was the center of the universe, Jerusalem. Still is. They put him to, the, to death by hanging, on, hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to, uh, to appear not to all the people, but to who, us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. In verse 42, and he commanded us to preach to the people. How will the people ever know? How will the people ever hear? We are to do what? Preach to the people. Come on, if you're a Christian, this is your, this is your job description. Preach to the people. And, test, and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The gospel. The gospel. The pure, simple gospel of Jesus Christ. Easy. Through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice... You can be saved. Here's the difference. This is the first time and really a forbidden moment that, that Peter finds himself in. He finds himself. How did Peter get to this specific moment? I love this story. This is probably one of my very favorite stories in all of Scripture. If you had to ask pastor what is one of your favorite stories in Scripture, it was the day that Cornelius prayed for Peter show up at his house. Listen, the last two decades, 
I know Jan is going to come in a little while, hopefully, and speak a little bit about India and our missionary efforts there, along with our outreach team and what they've done over this past month. But I just want to say, over the, over the last two decades, I've seen a surprising trend uh, um, uh, uh, amongst the Indian untouchable people. There is the, and I'm going to say this wrong, Dalit castle. And they are converting in mass to Christianity. In, and there's this caste system. Anybody know what caste means? Caste system, meaning that's where you're, you're separated. You're, that's your background. That's your kind. That's your, that's your standing. That's who you are. There's this caste system. And you are born into this caste system in, in India. You don't have any choice in it. You're, you're, this is who you are. This is where you live. This is your lot, your, your, your caste. And that system is written into their constitution. Come on now. The government's told them that this is who you are, and you stay there, and you're not allowed to change. You are a, you are amongst the untouchable folks. You are an outcast. You ever hear that? Drawn by this acceptance, there are tons and tons of government officials that are persecuting thousands and thousands of people across India. But in the midst of this persecution, thousands and thousands of Indian people are being converted to Christianity. For example, in Circuit District of Nepal, approximately, just in this one district, 50,000 of these people in this caste have been converted from Hinduism to Christianity. 50,000. 50,000. Just this year. What month is it? In part to the escape. They want to escape the... They have known all of their lives. They want to get away from. Aren't you glad that Jesus made access for all in the world? Not just for a few, but for everyone to come running and be rescued. Peter demonstrates today, I want us to look at this, that the Christian faith is open to people of all walks of life. After looking at some of the very early proclamations of the first Christians in the early church in Acts, this is where we are today. Today we are jumping ahead into Acts chapter 10, and here we see this Roman centurion. His name is Cornelius. I want you to put his picture up for me. Cornelius. That's not really him, but it's an actor that looks like him. I want you to see his face. Because it's not a face that you would normally say, I want to be that dude's friend. He was in a government situation. He was being overrun by laws and all kinds of precepts and all kinds of regulations that uh, told him that he had to persecute this early church. He was given orders to run after those and to play out these murderous acts upon which the early church would say is an abomination. If you believe in Jesus, this is an abomination. This is not, this is not the way of God. And so he was given, he was given the authority to take out those in the early church. Something about Jesus clung to his heart and into his mind. He was drawn to the faith in Jesus. And we first, we first, first off, listen, first off, the story that we're about to read in, in Acts chapter 10 in the early part about this centurion, uh, Cornelius, it, it really is a jumping off place to, to help you to understand that God is about setting us up for access. 
God is about setting us up for restoration. That's what happened this morning. God is setting us up for restoration. You may be here even still saying, God, I don't know that I've gotten the breakthrough that I need. Listen, keep praying. Don't stop praying. Keep praying. Keep believing for restoration. Keep believing for God to do something. He's on the way. He's not ever stopped being on the way or in the place that you need him to be. God is there. So this is a setup for an access. And he's gotten... Cornelius has gotten God's attention. I would wish for the church to get God's attention these days. What does it take, you know? I mean, is it just us coming in here and singing a couple songs and clapping a little bit and, you know, high-fiving your neighbor and maybe hugging a few folks and that, that got God's attention in your life? I wonder, I wonder how many things we miss, we miss because we haven't truly gotten his attention. Is this preaching too hard today? Are we okay? <laughs> help me out now. I need you to help me out, church. This is, this is where I go to church, so uh, help me out, y'all. Help me out. Who is this Cornelius? Who is this guy? God set up an access point. He causes the Lord to set up Peter's vision, Peter later has a vision in the first part of Acts chapter 10. We're going to look at it in just a second. Peter has this vision in Acts chapter 10 after Cornelius is found to gotten God's attention. This all took place so that the Gentiles, I need you guys to catch this. Are you guys still with me? So that the Gentiles could have access to to God so that you and I, you and I, if this moment hadn't taken place, I mean, I imagine God could have done it somewhere else in history, but if this moment hadn't taken place, then we, we, as the people of God, we couldn't have access. It was forbidden. And so God set up an access point. Somebody say access point. Because of Cornelius' prayers, because of his generosity, Because of his obedience, because of his love for God, God set up an access point. He opened up a door through the obedience of Cornelius. Come on, I need you to get this because this is for you. You're like, some of you are going, I don't even know what this means. What does this even mean? What this really means is if you are loving If you are generous, if you begin to pray, if you begin to obey the Lord's words, if you begin to love with this this crazy love that God's put in your heart, if you begin to say, I'm no longer going to live that way and I'm running after him, what kind of access points will God open up in your life? Who is this Cornelius? Acts chapter 10, verse 4 through 5 gives us a quick, I got a couple versions of the word here. I want you to look at this. Acts chapter 10, verse 4. And he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? The Lord had come to Cornelius. Here it is. I'm speeding ahead. Verse 4. And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now, and now send men to Joppa. And bring one Simon who is called Peter. Mm, I need to get this. Let's look at the message version of this. You got it, Luke? Or whoever's back there, Landon? Sorry. One more. Thank you. I want you to look at the message version of the same scripture. We all know that the angel in this scripture is the Lord. The Lord. The Lord came in the spirit. He said, your prayers and neighborly acts have brought you to God's attention. Your prayers and your neighborly acts. If you back up, he was a giver and he loved people and he loved God. His obedience got God's attention. In the very next part of that scripture, it says, here's what you are to do. Because you got my attention, it's going to take you to do something. 
for the next part of your life to happen. And a lot of us, we want to sit and wait for God to do it anyway. And we're not going to get out of our seats until it happens. But the truth of the matter is God is calling us to action. He's not calling us to sit down. He's calling us to stand up and walk in faith. Walk in faith. Walk in faith. Come on. God is calling us to walk in faith, not sit down. And because he was able to have the, the, the information ahead of time because of his obedience, the Lord's voice spoke to him. I'm going to say it again. Before Peter has a sermon with the untouchables, Peter had a vision. And he goes on the roof of a house of Simon the Tanner. Same name. He was like, Simon, Simon, Simon says. They were high-fiving. He's in the house of Simon the Tanner. Peter goes to the roof, and he has this vision. He's, he's laid out in the Lord. He's in a trance, the Bible says. He's in a trance, and he has this vision of a sheet, and unclean animals are coming. And then he hears a voice. Come on now. Listen. When you get a vision of God, listen, Peter was already filled with the Holy Spirit. He had already prayed. He had already, he had already prepared. He had already been in an upper room. He had already fasted. He had already waited on God. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He goes out and he preaches the word to them. And 5,000 people get saved. And then right, right after Paul is laid in the street in Damascus and his eyes are blinded and he becomes Saul becomes Paul. Right after that happens, in chapter 9, Peter has a vision. Because what? Cornelius was obedient. The Holy Spirit shows up and lines something up for us, which I feel like is the pivotal thing in Christianity today. Thing that we need to take upon ourselves. I want us to look at it. Acts chapter 10 verse 13 it says, And there came a voice to him. This was the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaking to him. It's a very simple command. He said, And there came a voice to him. And the voice says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And then the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. And this happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once into heaven. It's like God had to do it three times. Let me smack you in the face. I want you to say this with me. Rise, kill, eat. Rise, kill, eat. Rise, kill, eat. Something that by man's prior understanding would have seemed crazy, out of order, God May I tell you that you have to change direction because this doesn't look right. It doesn't look normal. Is it okay? Let me tell you something. It's okay to question God, but you don't stay there. And I hear him saying, oh, hey, Lord, you've never let me down this way before. I hear Peter saying, you've never told me to do this way before. But God, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit I have something on the inside of me that is a part of you. And I don't have to. I don't have to sit in rebellion anymore. I don't have to sit in this way anymore. I can run with obedience and know that if you said it, I'm going to do it. And I didn't know. I didn't know this was allowed is what he was saying. I didn't know if I could even believe this way. Let me just tell you something. God wants to break the back of religion in this world. He's looking to break the back of religion. I don't care what it takes. I don't care what it looks like. I don't, as long as it doesn't put me in prison, but if it puts me in prison, I guess I'll go to prison like Paul. Whatever it takes. And here's the ultimate goal. God, I know what you want to do. The reason why this all took place, the reason why he had to be led down this way was because 
because of one purpose, one line of effort, it was to save souls, to save souls, to save everybody, to get them to a place of eternity. Somebody give God praise. Now you can do better than that. Come on. Come on, let's hear a hallelujah. How about a yes, Lord? How about a oh, yeah? Man's response is from our own understanding. And can I tell you how flawed that understanding is? It is so messed up. It comes from a place of just, I was born this way. I acted this way. I had these parents. It comes from a background. It comes from a poverty level. It comes from all kinds of different ways. But God says your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. God, can, can I actually speak this way? What is our response? And can, can most of us say that, that our life in this world is not, our mind in this world is not God's mind? Help me out, church. Help me out. What would it take for you to finally get the, 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 the mind of Christ, would that mean that you have to give up whatever you were thinking before? Stop your level of thinking and get to God's level of thinking? Man's response to this thing, Peter, Peter, who is just a man who's filled with the Holy Spirit, he's got God on his side. He's moving and trying to walk. This is the first time in the entire history that, he's, that people were called to walk in the Spirit. And he's just kind of fumbling around. Okay, God, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit now. I've got a boldness on me. I'm trying to live the way that you want me to go. I'm trying to go the places you want me to go. But here I see a sheet that fell out of heaven and a bunch of animals that I'm not allowed to eat are on it. That's unclean. That's not right. That's not what we're supposed to do. If you knew anything about the traditions of that day, Jews were not allowed to even eat one thing that was unclean, or the word was kosher. You ever hear kosher dill pickles? They're so good. I, give me some of those right now. And for the first time, we see this mindset. Peter looks across the chasm of the rooftop and he sees these animals coming down on the sheet God speaks to him these are for you rise up, kill them and eat them God, I've never eaten anything like that before we're not allowed to touch those things we're not allowed to even be around those nasty pigs we're not allowed to be around that stuff if somebody told me I wasn't allowed to eat bacon Bacon goes with any meal or snack. And here we see Peter on the roof going, God, this doesn't seem right. Like for generations, we've not been able to do this thing. And, and, and this, and, and this happened. Peter doesn't know why this is happening. He's like, what is going on here, God? Why are you telling me this? And, and, and then all of a sudden, the voice says, those things that you say are unclean, I have made them clean. I have made them sanctified. I have restored them. You can eat them. And for him, I imagine him saying, God, okay, but I, I hear what you're saying, God. I hear what you're saying, God, but, but, but is what? You're doing what? You're really, you're really, you're really turning this thing upside down, God. You're really, you're really changing the culture. You're really... You're really changing the entire atmosphere of what the church is supposed to do. God, you're really shaking this thing up. Why are you saying all these things? A man's response is from our own understanding. God can and will speak. And our response can and most often is with a puny understanding. But God, somebody say, but God. 
God comes on the scene. I want us to look at a scripture that's found in Isaiah 55. The prophet Isaiah spoke of this before concerning God's compassion towards his people. I want you to hear what I just said again. God's compassion towards his people. God has compassion towards his people. He's always been in the millenniums that he's, that he's created us. He's, he, has, he has been, he's been trying to get us back to that cool of the day moment like Adam in the garden. He's trying to restore us back. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Come on, come on. I'm re- come on, I, if I studied it and I'm preaching it, I want you to just acknowledge it, okay? Okay. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts, then your thoughts. I want to see this part right here so clearly defined in your life. I want you to hear this. I want to put it on the screen. God's creation is not common. It's not common. It's not a common thing. I think it's, I th- I think it's no accident we are dealing with suicide this morning because the, and, and I call that thing out right now. Everybody's scared to death. Like, I'm going to call it out. I'm going to call it out right now. I, I, I think it's no accident we would call that thing, that demon, out this morning because that demon's defeated. Defeated completely. There's no, I have any problem saying that, okay? That demon is defeated in Jesus' name. So we call out that, listen, the church has to stop playing games. You've got to stop playing games, church. The church has got to stop playing games. We're not just in it to just high-five each other. We're in it to really get the things figured out that need to be rooted out of our lives so that we can live in victory and live in joy and live in peace. And listen, so if I call it out, that thing of suicide, I don't think it's any accident here. God's ways are higher than our ways. God's creation is not common. God set this moment up for you today that if you have... If you have a common kind of mentality, I want you to say to yourself, I am not common. I am God's creation. Say it. Come on. Some of you are, that are dealing with this stuff need to say that. I am not common. I am God's creation. It's not a confidence booster. It's the truth. This is not a self-help session. This is you getting everything that God's called for your life. All right. What God has made and created, he wants to, listen, restore. He wants to sanctify, meaning he wants to make clean. He wants to change. He wants to make clean. He wants to change and make acceptable. He wants to make you acceptable. He sends for Peter, and the apostle shares the gospel with him. And so Peter's message to Cornelius is found in Acts chapter 10, that 34 through 43 that we just read. One of the first things that stands out about Peter's proclamation is that the substance is the same, whether he is proclaiming the faith to the Jewish leader or to the high priest or to the Gentile, this Roman centurion, the substance of the message remains essentially unchanged. Jesus was a man of great power who was crucified, but then he rose from the dead, and now there is forgiveness in his name. Somebody say amen. The gospel message never changes. And the gospel message in that scripture now says that this common thing This common thing that we used to say, I'm not allowed to do that. I'm not allowed to be there. If you would understand the Jewish tradition, they were not even allowed to be in the same room with somebody who was not a Jew. So in this moment, when Cornelius has sent for Peter, this exact moment, when they run up the steps... These common folks run up the steps to talk to this spirit-filled Jew. He says, he says, I got to go because I just saw the sheet with the animals. Why did that, why did that happen? Because of Cornelius' faith. 
God had already set in motion the, 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 the histor- historical moment that would happen there. He had already set that in motion. And the gospel is a message for all people. It is not fluid in the sense that we, we can, it can be discarded in, in certain times and places, but rather the gospel, the same gospel, is to be shared with all people. And this doesn't mean that the text, the message is communicated the same way because the message of the gospel has been, has been translated and brought into different atmospheres and cultures all across the planet. We are going to talk about one today. Hopefully, we can get there still. If we don't, we'll get there sometime. Peter doesn't spend a long time appealing to the Old Testament prophets as he did in Acts chapter 2, but there isn't just one way to share the gospel. The gospel is shared and should be the same regardless of the people with whom it's being shared with. Though the core message is the same, there is a new emphasis in the application of the gospel that look at this in verse 34. He says it like this. Put it on the screen. God shows no partiality. What does this mean? Well, Cornelius was a Gentile, and therefore he was part of that people. But he loved God. He wasn't included in the God's covenant with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jewish ceremonial law governed Jewish thought and practice on what what was clean and what was unclean. By that definition... He was a common person. Gentiles were considered no different in their unclean state than, say, a pig. Thank God for Jesus. (laughs) We all be sitting around here going... But Peter realizes in the divine encounter with Cornelius that this is no longer the case. What God had made clean, let no one declare to be unclean. Acts chapter 10 verse 15. The cross of Christ is the great leveler of our lives. Despite your background, despite your sin, despite your success, your failures, your ethnicity, whatever it comes, the cross of Jesus Christ comes to make all people new. Peter proclaimed the gospel on that day and realized the truth of the impartial God. Paul would later celebrate that same truth when he declared these words in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Put it on the screen. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. The result of Peter's obedience and sharing the gospel. First of all, it was Cornelius' obedience that spurred, that spurred Peter's obedience. But Peter jumping up and going to Cornelius' house. Man, what I would have loved to be a fly on the wall in Cornelius' house in that moment. It, it, when, when Peter shows up to Cornelius' house and he shares the gospel of Jesus with these folks proclaiming the word to the untouchables. Come on, somebody. He was proclaiming the word of God to the untouchable people. And in Acts chapter 10, verse 44, this is what happened. I'm almost there. Are you okay? Acts chapter 10, verse 44, he says, While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who were heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people? Listen, who had received the Holy Spirit just as we have, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked him to remain for several, for some days. Listen, Peter finally had come to the proof he saw the sheet he heard the voice of Cornelius he went to his house all these things would have never happened had he not obeyed had he not obeyed then the Gentiles would have not ever received 
But because he obeyed, because he went to the highways and the hedges, because he went to places that no one else would want to go, because he went to the pig's sty, because he went to the place that didn't look right, because he talked to the people that no one else would, because he got up from where he was at and he went to the place that was untouchable, because he spoke to the people who were supposed to be the slime of the earth. They all got saved. And Peter finally had seen the proof of his vision. God had proved, proved his change in orders. The proof of his acceptance and compassion lay in the waters of the baptismal of the Gentiles. The proof had laid in the water. We had baptism last week, right? Were you here? If you were here for the baptism, you got to see us lay the stuff in the water. We went down dirty. We came out clean. We left the junk in the water. Listen, we're not going to go back to that way anymore. I'm not going to live that way. It's symbolic message of I'm not going to live this way any longer. I'm going to leave that junk in the water. I'm going to walk in faith. I'm going to walk in Jesus. I'm going to I'm going to hold my head high. I'm going to take I'm going to take responsibilities for my actions. I'm going to take sin and let God rip it out of my life. I'm going to let his son Jesus Christ disciple me. I'm going to be a I'm going to be risen with him. I'm going to be sitting right next to Jesus in heaven. I'm going to be worshiping him. I'm going to have a seat at the table. I'm going to leave that junk in the water. I'm not going back the way I used to be. I'm going to leave that stuff there, and I'm going to move where God wants me to go. Come on, somebody give God praise. And finally, we had seen this proof, this proof that it happened. Peter shows up and he preaches the gospel and all of a sudden they're filled with the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden the power of God floods over that house and just because they heard about Jesus, just because they accepted the message of Christ, it's four simple verses that change their life forever. It changed the trajectory of who they were supposed to be. It changed the trajectory of who they would become. Four little verses changed it all. What in the world are we doing? Like pigs, they went down in the water. Whew. I'm reminded of when Jesus when Jesus cast the demons out of the pigs, I'm reminded, I'm reminded, whoo, I'm reminded of when Jesus cast a legion of demons out into the pigs. And, and he says, and he tells them, and they went and they, they drowned in the water. And just, and just like those Gentiles went down in that baptism, it was like pigs going down and sheep coming up. Wait a minute, you used to have a pig face. You used to snort a lot. You used to look untouchable, but all of a sudden, you're going, nah. Which means there is a transformation that takes place when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. When we, there is a transformation that happens initially we just, we just by faith going, you know, some preacher told me, and I have this conviction, and my heart's beating pretty fast, and I'm supposed to live for God, and I don't know what else to do. My life is a wreck, and everything around me is a mess, but if I accept Jesus, what you're saying is, I go from being a pig to a sheep. That's right. Pig to a sheep. Gentiles were pigs. I hate to break it to you but you're a Gentile. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a Gentile. But you have a choice. You can be a pig or you can be a sheep. You can be a <laughs> digging in the dirt, wallowing in the mess, getting involved in the junk, drowning in, drowning in vomit, or you can become a sheep who eats in the field, who is fed by the shepherd, who lives by the house, who is, who, is, who, is, who is dependent upon the shepherd, the good shepherd, who's dependent upon, listen, you can be led by the shepherd or you can live and die in the mess in the sty. That's good preaching right there just for you, okay? And up until now, Peter has told nobody in this brotherhood about this story. He's, he's kind of heart beating, oh gosh, what just happened? 
the, the sheep thing and the animal stuff, it all came true. <laughs> What am I going to do? Nobody has heard this story. He's running around. He's frantic. Everybody's talking about it. All of a sudden, he's hearing, he's hearing little voices. Because, listen, once you've gotten God in your heart, once you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, listen, nobody can tell you. You can't shut you up. All of a sudden, everybody's starting to hear it. And the word is getting out. In chapter 11, the word has gotten out. In chapter 11, all the people are starting to hear it. The brothers, the apostles, the sisters, all have heard it. All those that are Jewish in Jerusalem, they have heard the story. They have heard the story of the pigs becoming sheep. And they're like, what is going on? Why have you gone to the Gentiles? Why, why, Peter? This is for us. He was the king of the Jews and the Jews only. Like, what happened? Jesus is our Jesus, not everybody's Jesus. When I'm preaching today, are you all right? And up until now, Peter told nobody, and then he goes to his brothers to tell the story. And until now, you know what's crazy is in this in this uh, chapter eleven, <laughs> in this chapter in this chapter eleven, um, it gets a little it gets a little detailed in the body parts, but it's talking about circumcised and uncircumcised. And for those that don't know, talk to Teresa afterwards, and she'll tell you, <laughs> circumcised and uncircumcised. For those that are moms, you'll understand. If you have a son, you get it. Circumcised, uncircumcised. You understand what that is. And as, as, as a baby, that's when, usually when that takes place so that they, they don't understand what's going on anyway. But what's crazy in chapter 11, and, and translated correctly, my favorite version of the Bible is the, is the ESV, my very, very favorite version. In the actual English trans, translation, if you were to look at it, it says the circumcision party. Meaning, meaning that they were part of a, a group of people that called them the circumcision party? As if you were to walk around going, I'm proud of that. I don't know what kind of weird traditions they had back in the day, but they were walking around holding, holding this uh, title as if they were part of this great big awesome group. This was the elite. This was the elite to just let me put it to a to a different way this was the elite Christ, this was the elite christians these are the ones that were like the hybrids of jews they took they took upon jesus christ as their savior and here's the apostles and the and the and the brothers and sisters that put themselves in the party called the circumcised party now, i know today we're all about oh goodness i can't believe they did that but that was the elite position Meaning they were the, the head of this new found church. And they ran up to Peter and they're like, Peter, what in the world just happened over there, man? You got to tell us a story. And so he begins to tell them the whole story. I preached the gospel and this is what happened. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then becomes, up until this point, this is probably the greatest proclamation in Christendom for us. Up until this point, here it is. Because I don't know what you're proclaiming over your life. But for me, this is my proclamation over my house. Acts chapter 11, verse 15 says, As I began to speak, this is Peter, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as, as on us at the beginning. Verse 16, And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same spirit, the same gift to them as he gave to us when, he, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? Who was it that I could stand in God's way? Verse 18, when they had heard these things. Now, when you hear that kind of tone, it means like they got nothing to say except this. This is what they say. When they had heard these things. It fell silent. It shut up all the doubt because they had proof. They had the proof of the Holy Spirit filling them up, speaking in other tongues. And they glorify God saying this. This is, the, this is the proclamation. Are you ready? Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads 
to life, meaning everybody gets saved, everybody gets access, everybody gets in, everybody's able to make it to heaven, everybody's able to sit at the table someday. The reality of this one miracle was recanted by the, to the apostles in Jerusalem. This brought about the great historical changing proclamation. The Gentiles also have been saved. They also have access. Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. All that I'm going to say to you today what the world calls common God says it's not common. And if you've been living in a world of mess, if you've been living in a world of sin, if you've been living in a world of misery, all you have to do, listen, you have access. You have complete access to the Father. Listen, everybody has access now. Everybody has a way back. Everybody has this as access. All, all I can say, nobody is separated. What stands out to me in the story is that because of the prayers of what I would probably call the deplorable, the untouchable, Cornelius, he had, he had given access. He had awakened God's attention. He had got his centered attention. He had answered the prayer by sending Peter to his house. This sets up this setback that they thought they had. Listen, everybody else is getting Jesus in their life. Everybody else is getting filled with this great big power. What about us? We're just the pigs in the sty. What about us? We're just the mess that gets thrown away, I guess. We're just the garbage in the, in the, in the garbage disposal. We'll never have access. No, because of Cornelius' obedience, because of the way he lived his life, it set up, this, this setback became a setup for a comeback so that they could have access to the Father. Stand with me, if you will. We're going to have to be done, Jan. I'm just not sure it makes sense at this point. Can you be ready again? I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay. I know that might be a little bit of a different message, but I was the word of God. I really felt strong about this story. This is one of my favorite stories. And what I realized is that is that there because of this this act, because of this one, because of this one act of Peter, because of his obedience to go to Cornelius' house, that we all have access. We all have access. It could have happened another way. There could have been another story, but this is our story. This is your story. This is your kid's story. This is your grandkid's story. This is your way back. This is your access. The one thing that it stands out to me the biggest in the story was that Cornelius was was called common. He was called called common. He was, for us, a lot of us are going through so much in our lives that we feel, we don't feel good in, we don't feel good about anything. We don't feel like we have, that we can, that we can create or be anybody. But God says, because of what Jesus did on the cross, you have, you have not only access, but you have life and life more abundantly. You're not supposed to live in misery. You're not supposed to live in despair. You're not supposed to live in depression. You're not spo- you don't listen. You might be there, but you don't have to stay there. You don't you don't have to live in anxiety. You don't have to live listen. This life-giving access was not was not meant so that you can just say, I'm going to get to heaven one day. This life-giving access was so that you could have life right here, heaven on earth right here, so that you could have that heaven in your heart to bring you through the moments of life. Cornelius probably never even imagined, could have never even imagined what that access meant, truly meant until Peter showed up at his doorstep. Man, I just pray for Peters to show up at your doorsteps. <laughs> I just pray that, that obedient men of God, women of God, show up at your doorstep. But more than that, 
I pray that you're the obedient men and women of God. Show up at somebody else's doorstep. That you could grab a hold of a vision of God. And get that vision in your heart and in your mind. And run after it. If you're watching me on the camera, or if you're hearing my voice in this room, you don't have to sit on your faith anymore. Get up and walk in the Spirit. Listen, you may have thought you were just a common person with a common goal, with a common thing, with an easy going whatever, and I'm just supposed to be this, and I'm just supposed to go to this job and work this thing and have this retirement. But God says you're supposed to, you're supposed to, to, to chase out lions. You're supposed to run after, after dreams. You're supposed to get into people's destiny. You're supposed to run after and chase demons off. You're supposed to cast out the enemy out of people's lives. You, you were called and created to do those things. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. I just want you to say this with me. I have hope now. get there now. I can make it one more day. See, the reality of what Jesus did on the cross was so that you can make it not just into heaven, but every single moment of every single day. And you may be standing in this room going, I, I don't think I can make it one more moment. And we already prayed for a lot of folks, but maybe you need prayer. Maybe you didn't come up here earlier. Maybe you need a breakthrough. This is your moment. As they worship and sing this song, this altar is open. We're going to be here for a few, few short more minutes. And then we'll be dismissed, but I want everybody to stay in place. I don't want nobody moving around. If, if, you, if you have to leave, I get it. I won't, I won't point you out, but I just, I just feel like this moment is sacred. We should take a second to really understand what God wants to do in this moment. If God is calling you to a higher place. This is your moment. Let's worship the Lord for just a second and we'll pray. Father, God, I pray over this entire room today. God, if there is one that needs a touch from you, if there is one that needs a new move from you, God, I pray that you pour in new wine and you put it into new wine skins. I pray, God, that you, you pour out your spirit on them, 
that God, you meet them just like you met Cornelius and the people in his house. I pray, God, that they're filled with your Holy Spirit, that salvation floods their soul. I pray for houses. Today, I pray for, for those that are, the families that are in need. I pray, God, for miracles and signs and wonders to follow the believers. God, as we make decisions to get closer to you, to be discipled by your Holy Spirit, I pray, God, that you just break down barriers and walls. God, that you would bring us into a place of fellowship with like believers, that you surround us with people that care and that people that know your word. I surround us with those that can add and multiply to our lives and not subtract and divide us. In Jesus' name, and everyone shout it. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. Before we leave, let's... Uh, before we go, thank you. Before we go, I want you to just, uh, can we just give God a big hand clap of praise for who he is? Amen. I think I just got about two announcements for you real quick before we go, and then I w we're going to receive our offering and tithes unto the Lord. So if you could prepare those as I, uh, as I get these messages out to you. Specifically, there's a whole lot of stuff happening in your bulletin. Um, if you get that, you can get that online, I believe, as well. We have that online as well. You can look at that. You should never miss anything that we're doing. It's all online, Facebook. It's in your hands if you're here. It's on our, our Facebook, uh, our family page. If you're not a part of the family page, you can become a part of that. But there's a whole lot of things going on all the time, constantly. Um, so Wednesday night, the youth are still meeting. We're, we are doing a food giveaway, uh, not this Saturday, but next, I'm sorry, this Saturday. Yes, it is May 1st. This coming Saturday, if you know families, listen to me, hear me out. If you know families that need food, we are giving away a lot of produce, free stuff for them to just pick up. Don't have to sign any paperwork. There is no... There is no kind of rigmarole. All it is is they're dumping off truckloads of food to us, and we are giving it away. And I don't, I don't, I, I just want to bless the body of Christ. I want to bless anybody that needs it. But this Saturday, this Saturday, somebody say this Saturday, we'll be bringing fresh produce to the parking lot at noon, noon, 12 o'clock. Let's come on out this Saturday. Volunteers will be needed, though, to unload the truck, set up the tables, direct the traffic. Help load cars and all those kinds of things. Miss Barb, where you at? Oh, there she is. Miss Barb is in the back, and she will help you. Um, she's holding up signs. We want to make sure that we get this out. She, you guys can take some of those signs, maybe put them up at your work, wherever you're at. But see her. She's got signs available in the very back. Um, the PHP Outreach We'll be having a meeting next Sunday right after, uh, immediately after the service in the coffee room. This is for anybody who wants to know more about how they can get connected to what we're doing with our outreach ministry. So if you want to be connected or be involved in any way, um, you want to you want to be at that meeting right after service next Sunday. Next Sunday. I just want to make a plug. This I know this is a week away. But are about a week and a half away, but the March of, I'm sorry, the March of Prayer. The National Day of Prayer is Thursday, May 6th. We will be downtown with our worship team, uh, downtown uh, at 1130 at the gazebo in the Central Park. So you want to be there for that. A lot of other things happening. I want you to just check out your bulletins for that. Um, if you would like to give online, you can do that today. Text to give, that should be on the screen, hopefully. And uh, we want to make sure that you get the opportunity to give this morning. Let's have you just enjoyed what God has done in the house this morning. Amen. And I just want to make mention, I, uh, I pushed back what happened uh, with, uh, with Pastor Jan today. She uh, wanted to come and speak about, and she will, she will speak about uh, India and in our, in our uh, missionary work in India. I know I made mention of India today. Um, we have missionary, I'm sorry, we have pastors on the ground. They're not missionaries. Pastors on the ground from India that are working in India. 
um, and we are going to try to support them um, today. You can give today an offering. All the offerings today, if you're giving an offering, um, right there you can give an offering right in the, the second part of that text. If you'd like to give an offering, you can give by check, you can give by cash today. But all the loose offering today and anything designated offering today will go specifically. This won't be the only opportunity to give to India. Um, so if you're like, I want to give, but I can't do it till next week or whatever, we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to hear the message about India and what that means. And so I want you to, to do me a favor. If you would specifically designate some uh, finances towards our mission in India, it is specific. They are trying to go out and preach the gospel in probably m the, m one of the biggest, uh, most contentious parts of the country. They want a mobile church so that they can get out and go, and we need to help them get there. And so we want to do that. That mission you'll hear about from Jan in maybe a week or two, okay? Amen. Amen. All hearts and minds clear. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. I thank you for this word, which was burning on my heart all week, and I pray, God, that it would go and effectively do the work that you called it to do. I pray over this offering and this tithe, which is holy. I pray, God, that your what you do in this place and what you do through people, God, would be miraculous. God, thank you for access. Thank you for a way back. Thank you for the obedience of one so that we could have access to the Father. We love you today. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. God bless you. Thank you for your giving.